Oh, hi. I'm um, trying to think what, what I would say in five to six minutes. Um, no, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, my, my research is in the area of forgiveness. And um, it, it began because of two reasons. One, because I myself was very badly hurt. And, and none of the therapeutic skills that I had been taught were of any use. And, and, and I did the things that like therapists do, and um, I emoted, and I blamed, and I, I, I did all the stuff, and I wrote letters, you know, and didn't send them, and all, all the therapist stuff. But um, it wasn't effective. And... It, it was only when I, when I opened to the quality of forgiveness in myself did um, did things really shift and change. So that was that was part of the motivation for trying to do research on forgiveness. The second was, and this is this is the relationship to this group. Um, I, I I had a very strong belief at at that time, and this was before positive psychology showed up and, and was able to prove that many of the things that we actually believe have empirical value. But I, I really believe that for, for spiritual qualities to be true, they had to be true on the most mundane, tangible, physical sense, that if they were ethereally true, but physically not true, they weren't true. And so I set out to do, this was before anybody was doing this stuff, almost 20 years ago, an empirical study, randomized controlled study, that people who were hurt, who learned to forgive, would be healthier if they forgave. And it, it just struck me as that was the necessary use of science in terms of furthering understanding of spiritual qualities. Um, because I, I was never comfortable with people saying, well, you can't know, or I know it's true, but I can't prove it, or, you know, it's true only from a certain point of view, or you have to have the consciousness before you can understand it. N none of that satisfied me. Again, because I had a very simplistic notion that, um, I don't know how to put this, that like, I guess goodness, which was distilled spirit, like, had to be health enhancing and had to be relationship enhancing and had to be nurturing in, in ways that could be measured. And, it, and if it proved out to be not so, then, and I remember the Dalai Lama saying, you know, if, if science disproves Buddhism, then I give up Buddhism. You know, it's like, because uh, what am I going to do if it's, if the laws of nature, which are measurable also, say this is wrong, then, you know, I'm going to have a little bit harder time. Thankfully, my research showed that forgiveness was good for you. Otherwise, I would have had more psychic confusion than I actually have. Um, and, and the last thing that I will say was just that I, I did, in my time being a researcher at Stanford's medical school, I did about six or seven studies on showing that the forgiveness methodology that I developed was helpful for people's well-being, both emotional, physical, and relational. And it made a difference in people with blood pressure problems, and it made a difference with people with, you know, other kinds of physical issues, and it worked on depression and stress and anxiety. And um, it also had a, a modest effect on other spiritual qualities. And, you know, now that work is mainstream, but when I did it almost 20 years ago, it was, it was unusual. So, thank you. Hello, everybody. It's really an honor to be here. I'm an ITP alumni. I'm, uh, I came to the U.S. in 2006. I'm a clinical psychologist from Germany. Fred was one of my mentors at ITP, so I feel really honored to sit next to Fred on this panel, although it's a little bit difficult to speak after Fred, so I hope I can deliver something here. Um, so um, I, I'm for more than 20 years, so I'm a clinical psychologist and body psychotherapist in Germany, and 
2004, I survived the Asian tsunami in Thailand, had a near-death experience, came back to life, and uh, received this calling that I should work on on body-centered um, healing practices after such experiences of trauma. And um, that's why I decided to come to the US and um, to study transpersonal psychology in addition to clinical psychology. So I specialized here in transpersonal research. After being such a long-term practitioner, I found really passion for research. And I feel like in the second half of my life, I, I just really wanted to dedicate a lot of time to research. So I would call my research practice-based research. It really comes out of my wealth and value of 20 years of clinical work. I'm specialized in working with all kinds of trauma and um, my core concept is embodiment. So um, I have the understanding and also the experience. The inner power of healing themselves. So I kind of enjoy the clinical practice, but still I'm passionate about research. And actually I found out that research doesn't come before clinical, like I thought when I was in medical school. Research and clinical practice actually go together. I think they really are in intertwined between each other. And the way I use now research is in the transpersonal field is to do uh, research in clinical practice. And this is, I think it's very important, not just because the mainstream psychology would accept and acknowledge me, even because I'm a psychiatrist, so they wouldn't do it anyway, but it's because it's important uh, working in a hospital means helping more people than just doing private clinical practice. And uh, uh, to have the students of the school in Milan to get into the hospital sometimes is difficult because they don't really know what transpersonal psychotherapy is, they don't know what the beer transenergetic is. So I started to do a study, a clinical study on the beer transenergetic model and I'm, I used the heuristic approach. This is because the, the way it works in the clinical practice is a very close to the heuristic approach. And it's been quite challenging and actually very exciting also to apply this technique in, a, in the clinical study because coming from the medical field, clinical studies means that you have to use a standard method of therapy so how can this be done in the transpersonal psychotherapy that, of course, there is no standard method? And so it's been quite challenging and exciting to adapt the heuristic approach to this kind, to this field. And what I do also is to teach in the school and try to get the students interested in <coughs> research and using research in their clinical practice, because I think this is important not just to help them in their practice, but also to let the, to have the transpersonal, uh, to have a wider audience for the transpersonal psychotherapy and psychology. And I think this is absolutely important and necessary. <coughs> so thank you for your attention. <clears throat> I'd like to, uh, my name's Frank Eckenhofer. And uh, I'd like to follow up with your discussion about heuristic research, because I also use that method myself. And we were talking earlier about it, adapting it. It's a method that you can adapt. And that's why I like it, because it seems to be, it's a systematic approach to subjective experience, but it has a structure. So I, I, think, I think for transpersonal work, we, we do need structure, we do need forms that, are, that can be, they're not going to be perfectly the same with each person, but there is a form that you follow that you can adapt. So I think I've been searching for good um, measures for, for transpersonal experience, and uh, heuristic research to me is a very good method. Basically, one of the ideas is you treat um, the people that typically you would call participants or subjects, you call them co-researchers. So it really levels the kind of authority issues in, in the research. So that's one dimension I think is really good for transpersonal work. And um, my research area is in ayahuasca research. 
and um, I it was in it was it was it was um, I became fascinated with with science and discovery and transpersonal psychology all at the same time. I don't see it in my mind. There's not a distinction. I know there's a lot of a lot of um, a sense that there's a polarity and a struggle between these two, but in myself, I don't feel it. Uh, I love science. I think it's when used properly. I think it's a it's beautiful, uh, precise, elegant. Uh, when applied the right way, uh, it's just you know finding the right method. But there's a beauty to science. Um, and so for me, when I first heard about Zen masters having particular brain rate patterns, I mean, this is your, your you've asked this question maybe twice at least, right, at the conference. <laughs> it was my experience too, that I thought, wow, this is so amazing. You know, uh, Zen masters have a particular kind of EEG patterns. This was a study done by Harai in 74 in Kyoto University in Japan. But it, it, it was published in Psychology Today, I think, in 69. Um, but I was just so struck by that article that, that we would have this correspondence between the most advanced Zen practitioners and these physiological measures. And as soon as I saw that study, I, I knew I wanted to learn EEG technology and I wanted to study Zen, those two things together. Um, and so I did my dissertation using EEG. So I wanted to get a dissertation in psychology, but I wanted to learn the method of EEG, and now it's called quantitative EEG. And I've done a series of studies, both in meditation, but more recently in ayahuasca, and the research is in, in Peru and Brazil. And um, what I, my goal is to get the best kind of EEG data and the best type of subjective report data, and to really look at those two data sets and to create an atmosphere that's ideal for, for subjective experience so, so the person can have a, a really very positive transpersonal experience and also at the same time that we can collect good data. So it's quite of a challenge, you know, to do those two things. So typically I work with people that are very experienced in taking ayahuasca and they're also co-researchers. So there'll, there'll be people that are also trained in the technology. So it's sort of like people know both worlds. They know the world of ayahuasca and their own practice, their own developmental process, and they're familiar with where they're going. At the same time, they're not, they're not unfamiliar with the EEG because they know that part too. So the, these people are really co-researchers. So for me, that's a really good model when you want to use neuroscience because if the person is naive to say neuroscience, it's going to be very upsetting to them. You know, it's going to be very, it's going to ruin their experience, but not, not so for if you take this other approach. If they're co-researchers, then they know, they know both sides of the story. You know, the scientific side and the subjective experience side. And, uh, and I just want to mention one thing that two, I had two uh, students, two dissertation students that really have affected my current thinking. And I wanted, I'm, I'm planning to, another study to do in Peru, probably this summer. And, and this study is going to try to be more expansive and really look at gender differences. I think uh, the two dissertations students I had were both women and they, they taught me really in their work that, that it's really important to look at gender differences and, and transformative experience. So that's going to be one of the goals for the, the study in Peru. Thank you. Hello again, and uh, I think I don't need to introduce myself. I'm Les. Uh, so there's two things I'd like to do. Uh, I don't know how much time we'll allow. Uh, one is to tell you a bit about the research that I've been involved in. Um, but the second, in a way, I think is slightly more important as well. And that is to, and, and I think we've all been doing this in a way, is, is to try and draw out some of the principles of research. And, you know, what, what, what is transpersonal research? Is there such a thing as transpersonal research? Yes. And, you know, and how does that relate to the broader church of, of, the, of, 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 of the academic community? So let me start with the first. Um, that was to say what I've been involved in. 
uh, just briefly, uh, and I can actually pick up relating to what you've been talking about, was one of the major projects I was involved in recently was uh, a heuristic study. And the point about heuristic study, I mean, you said about co-researchers, and all that is correct. But the other thing is that it places self, uh, yes. you know, self as a central factor. Yeah. And of course, that I think very much characterizes uh, research under the, uh, under the, uh, the, the, the orbit of, of transpersonal work, you know, um, so much scientific research, it goes back to what Jim Fadiman was saying before, you know, about the, <laughs> the relevance test, what, you know, is this really useful? Well, if it's about yourself, yes, it's, uh, it's going to be useful. Um, maybe it's useful to yourself, but I think if it's about yourself, in a sense it's useful beyond that, because you're talking about value. One of the, so anyway, that's just an introduction, so this area is about uh, the nature, uh, the way in which disease becomes sacred. So, uh, sacred illness. What is it when um, an unfortunate uh, event, uh, some kind of disease or some deformity or, or whatever it might be, uh, is perceived by that person in sacred terms? And, and, and what difference does that make? So, it's not, it's not, a, you know, it's not a quantitative study in the sort of say, well, do they get better more quickly? That's not the question. The question is, what is the value and what is the process that a person goes through in recognising that something that the rest of the world might think is a terrible disaster actually is playing a crucial role in their life in a transpersonal sense. So that's, that's one area of research. Um, other areas are, are non-empirical as well. I think the non-empirical side is, is equally important. So I am... Uh, I spent a lot of time looking into uh, spirit, the text, textual material in, in, in Buddhism, for example, the Abhidharma of the, of the, of the Pali Canon in, in Buddhism, which focuses a very, very small aspect, but really interesting from the point of psychological research, focusing this, this literature dating back way, way, way back, which is looking at what they call the sense door process. In other words, perception. And so my interest was to look at the way in which these very sophisticated first-person treaties, you know, obviously the Buddhist material come from intense meditation, the way in which those ideas related to what was coming through in terms of cognitive neuroscience. Uh, so which processes, which processes in the brain relate to what some ancient Buddhist text is talking about. And there are, these, are, you know, these aren't vague texts. These are talking about very precise processes within what we would call the perceptual process. And that's really important. I'm not claiming that my work is, is important. But what is important is to recognize that, that science does not operate, as it were, with data alone. You know, we think of the crazy scientists, the, you know, the, the EEG, that's the data. Um, but of course, it's not. all that data is filtered through interpretation. And a crucial part of the research endeavor is model building. And when I look into, I've talked about the Abhidharma, another main area that I've been writing on research comes from the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, and how texts from the 12th century, 13th century are talking about things that we would describe as psychology. And so bringing that material, and it's, not, it's complex material, you've got to decode it. You know, it's a whole different symbol system, and that's another story in itself. So bringing that in relation to contemporary neuroscience, uh, cognitive science, or ideas of depth psychology, and, and, and building those models which help to shape the way in which we interpret the data that, that we have. So um, I said that the session... <laughs> We're running out of time, but the other thing I wanted to say, and I'm going to say it in just a few words, but each, you know, each is a kind of lecture in itself. What is research? And, and, and of course, we talk about methodology. So we've talked about heuristic and, and, and so on. Um, but it's not just about methodology. It's, it's about the structures that we use to explain, explanatory structures. It's about the value we place on transformation. These, these are the areas that differentiate us from what others might call mainstream science. But you know, once you can formulate what those paradigms are and the parameters involved, you can start to see the relationship 
between what I might say is transpersonal work and which is another work which may not have that label. So that's what I, I, I think a big theme in what I'm saying, I said it in the education panel as well. I believe in those bridges. I want to build those bridges and, and I, mean, I say I want to build them. I think we have built them and they are there. You know, this, there's a myth, I'll finish with this, you know. It's a myth that transpersonal psychology is out on a limb from the point of view of transpersonal, of, uh, sorry, from the point of view of sort of mainstream psychology. What is mainstream psychology? You know, open, open, go to lectures or whatever is mainstream psychology. We're talking about mindfulness. We're talking about spirituality in health. And it's been said these are areas that uh, your transpersonal psychology initiated, but we're still engaged. And, and to build those bridges in terms of the, par param the parameters of the research project, that's what I'm involved in. So, uh, so we, uh, the panelists, decided that maybe you'd like to hear us talk among ourselves about certain questions or also entertain uh, questions from the audience. So are there any questions you'd like us to address for you? Yeah. I'm trying to frame this as a kind of a panel response, so um, <laughs> let me just think how to do that. Um, I, I feel that uh, I don't know. That's mo the, 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 my most immediate answer. I really don't know, but I just know that context is very important. And from my own experience, everything I learned showed up in my ayahuasca experiences. Mm. So all my prior background seemed to be given, uh, given greater emphasis and attention, something like that. So um, I think that's true for most people I've talked to. Um, is, I was curious about if maybe if we have any questions for each other. Yeah, actually, um, as I did, uh, my previous research field was in, in neuroscience and something that I studied to don't like about neuroscience approach is that they make like just a strict correlation so you make you have um, some finding in some part of the brain and so you think that you found the area of uh, um, this kind of emotion or the area maybe of this uh, ayahuasca or this is the area where you see the jaguar or you don't see the jaguar so how can you avoid this simplify this make it so simple. I think we were talking about a little bit the value of uh, different types of. You know, there's one type of research where you you study one person repeatedly over time. It's kind of a longitudinal study. It's an n of one, one person over time. And I, I think in many ways for certain phenomena in the beginning it might be advantageous to just work with it within one person's experience. So in that way, you can have a hunch when you start to see the first correlation. But then, let's see it again, let's see it again, let's see it again. So it's repeated measures, basically. Do we see this again? Does it keep showing up? Does the phenomenology continue to correspond with the, with the kind of patterning we see in the EEG? Right? So that's one method, I think. What do you think? Uh, well, yes, but it's, I was wondering about, because many times neuroscience doesn't consider the meaning of the experience. Yeah. So the inner meaning of the experience is not just that the brain, that area of the brain uh, responds to this, to that stimulus, yeah. but it's the meaning that the stimulus has for the people, for the person. Can, yes, I, I can wonder. Yeah. Yeah. You may, um, I'm sure you'll know about uh, f phrenology, right? Mm -hmm. you know, bumps on the head and everything. And uh, the, you know, this is 21st century phrenology. Yes. You're talking about. <laughs> and uh, you know, the issue with phrenology uh, is not only you know was it scientific and are the bumps of any interest or whatever, but the interesting thing about phrenology are the categories that they regarded as functions. 
So, you know, at least, you, you know, these, these uh, phrenological heads, you know, uh, a centre for patriotism, yeah? uh, uh, a, a centre for domesticity. Yeah? So these were projections of that age, and we still do it. That's my answer to your question. I mean, another answer to the question is actually that our real challenges raise, especially in relation to functional MRI. You know, I mean, we're conditioned to look at the colours. Ah, this is, this, it is yellow. So that tells me a great deal. Well, that actually, if you, if you understand the, the computing involved in bringing about the, that, that, that codification, there are some questions that need to be asked. So it's, it, it's, it's not as clear cut as it seems. And, and so that, you know, my, my semi humorous connection with phrenology does have some basis. And I think, finally, the point that I mean, absolutely right, totally agree with you. It's about meaning. And that's why I said about these phrenological bumps, you know, is do we want to see a, a centre of patriotism in the brain? That's, that's about meaning. And we create our meaning. The danger is that we, we create that meaning on the back of neuroscience, because it's so powerful today. We create that meaning in a highly reductive kind of way. And instead of opening up, opening up our scale of exploration, we narrow it down. That's the danger. I think also, let's say, there's, I think the classic shamanic journey experience has a certain structure to it. So some things, like in my work in the ayahuasca, there's a phenomenological process that shows up again and again with different people. So it might, not that it's universal, but clearly it, you go to another world, you receive knowledge, you may be experiencing a guide, a, a being that speaks to you, maybe you go through hardship, maybe you're dismembered, eventually you come back, but it has a structure, there's a phenomenological structure. So it's the kind of thing that will arise during a research recording. So if that arises repeatedly, you can be doing EEG while that's happening. You know, it's not, you, can't, you can't make that happen, but if you work with very experienced people, often it does happen. So there is a strategy where the meaning component is, has been, to some sense, stabilized, not just by Westerners, but by indigenous people mm -hmm. too. So we know we have a phenomenon, it's a real phenomenon. We don't exactly know what it means. But, we, but it is a, a structured phenomenon that's archetypal. So in that sense, we can, if that's arising, we can correlate that with particular patterns. The question is, are there patterns that go along? And that's the question I'd love to answer. You know, whether there are specific patterns, and I suspect there, there are some changes, there are some major changes in how, the, how um, I've seen, I think, I have some evidence for some of these changes. So it's really, I think science can appropriately use measurements to, to sort out the phenomenology, but the phenomenology comes first, right? Mm -hmm. The phenomenology guides the process of research, I think. So I think we just have a minute. So um, do, do we also have a time for questions? Yep. Is that possible? Can I just say one thing? Yeah, sure. You know, um, as somebody who was trained in a major research university to do, um, you know, clinical trials, what, what, what strikes me as so interesting is what it means to, to hear the results of research. And, and, and I, I know there's a lot of frustration because... Um, you know, results can be contradictory and, you know, one time, you know, eggs are good for you and then they're bad for you and, you know, the, this causes that and that causes this. And, 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 and what's, what's so challenging is, is, is for me to understand that, and, and for anybody else, is just the unbelievable complexity of this life. Mm -hmm. And, and the methods that we have to examine it are, are at this point inadequate for any definitive conclusions. And, and yet, you know, we make small progress, but we would like, I think, because I, I do still do research, we'd like to be more capable than, than we are. 
and and it's very interesting. So we're like we're, we're still all groping in the dark to some degree, and um, you know there's a there's a kind of ironic humility to that. So. Amen. <laughs> What's that? I said amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to add also something like, um, I, I think it was mentioned several times that it's so important to, to that we more, maybe more interconnect and collaborate. So regarding my research method, for example, which is really clearly qualitative, um, I know Glenn Hartelius, um, somatic approach in phenomenology, so that could be a mixed method approach or uh, combining it with new phenomenology. So what I feel is also really important that as researchers that we know our neighbors and um, you know that we acknowledge our neighbors or that we even look how we could collaborate more because I feel really we, we just said it in, in the break more and more also in the qualitative field more and more approaches are, are coming up so and so in Korea and so and so in Korea so I feel it's probably more important that would be also a link to the, the symposium theme um, unity within diversity um, that we should probably also uh, <coughs> remember again our common course in research and how we could work together. There's a question. I have a question. <clears throat> Earlier in reference to research it was said um, to ask the question if so, so what? And so when I think about, especially as I'm a student here in my first year, as I approach a dissertation topic and thinking about, okay, what can I possibly ask that there's a really important so what? I'm thinking about, you know, the, the idea of um, being able to, to demonstrate the human spirit. And so along those lines, I wanted to open up a question of what approaches um, do you have in mind for approaching the question of is there a human spirit and if you have any um, you know your first thoughts really let's free associate on the question of what is your thought around research and the human spirit well the first thing that I would say about this is that, you know, if I consider my previous background in research is that you can really do research on spirit because, you know, research the way it was intended for me, on especially, let's say, from the quantitative kind of method of research, is not something that you can measure. So it's like, well, you can do research on spirit, it's something... Uh, now I would say that you can do a kind of um, what's the meaning of spirit for that person. Right. So you can do research not just to, to demonstrate that spirit exists or doesn't exist, but what's the meaning of spirit? And, and does it make a difference? I think that, you know, exactly what you're saying, but I would just add on, does it make a difference? Because, I mean, it's, you know, we, again, you can't, we can't research spirit, but we can research the way it makes a difference to people's lives when they incorporate. I mean, it's like the example I gave from my own work about, you know, about how people respond to serious illness. You know? And the person who holds that there's a, a sacred dimension, it does make a difference. It, it's a, it also this point that with Fred, you know, <coughs> with forgiveness, it makes a difference. And I think that that would be what I, you know, you can't be too grand, you can't be too large scale. I mean, you know, that, that's another kind of question. But I think through the, um, like we're talking about heuristic methods or other methods relevant to the transpersonal, I think that's what it comes down to, is how to, and the point about difference and meaning. And, and from the heuristic point of view, it comes to you. Like, what is your question about spirit? Yeah. Yeah. So, first the inquiry would be toward yourself, to, to, to ground it in your own experience. Like, what would you like to know more? And that makes it meaningful, because, you know, that's, that's where it begins. It begins with us, it begins with our curiosity, our yearning to know. So that's where it's situated in the beginning, and then uh, from there you, you get more ideas about it. How to work with it, but it sort of has to begin there. I mean, for me, that's the that's a good place for it to begin. 
the, 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 at least the challenge for me has been the, the, the gray area between being an advocate and a scientist. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, at, at some level both are necessary, but if you're going to do research, you have to be willing to have your data disprove you. And otherwise, you're not doing research. You're doing advocacy. And, and, and just a, a small, like, semi-humorous story from my own work is I was giving a talk at Stanford's medical school probably 10 years ago, and there were hundreds of people in the auditorium, and I was talking about the health benefits of forgiveness, having done one research project. And I knew that the data for the next research project was just about finished and it, it had hundreds of participants and like I'm standing up there talking about the, the health benefits of forgiveness knowing that I could be going home to an email that said your study didn't work. <laughs> and and, and that's, that's, I think that's really the only way you can do research. Like you, you have to be willing to be disproven. And, and if you're not, then, then you're not really, research isn't really the agenda. And it's tough. It, it's a tough line. I would like to share a, a, a little bit my vision and uh, do an answer to you. Uh, I try to do this uh, with a metaphor. We are living uh, with the eyes, the eye closed and uh, we are researching the world with closed eyes. And of course, we have to measure to have some, something, you know, for validate our experience. But with, the, with, with open eyes, it's completely different, our work. That is, I am saying that the mainstream science works like the eyes are closed and, uh, and to measure the reality that is illusion. If we open eyes, that is, we enter in second attention, we enter in an in a awareness state of consciousness, we see the reality more clear. So change completely the, the way of research. Uh, what do you think about? Yeah, part of part of the uh, heuristic method is that if we also don't have the direct experience, we can't really study the phenomena. So whatever the phenomena is, from a heuristic point of view, you already have to have access to the phenomena experientially. So if you want to study a certain type of altered state, by definition, you need to have access to that state. You can't research it from a heuristic point of view unless you already have access. So some of these areas for study require maybe a lot of discipline, maybe meditative discipline, Mm -hmm. maybe different things to be able to gain access. And once you gain access, then you can explore it yourself personally and then have co-researchers with you, you know, seeing what individual differences are. But I think your point is excellent. You have to be able to gain access to the phenomena that you want to investigate very clearly from, from this point of view. I could say also something to that. Means I, since I know your method also, second attention epistemology, which is very close to Chandlin's focusing and experiential phenomenology and also my approach, um, it is to work in layers as, as you practice this also. So <coughs> you try to go deeper and deeper into the phenomena in uh, exploring different levels of um, experience and asking always the same question, such as what is the phenomenon that I just experienced now? And then you go deeper and deeper and deeper what you, ex- uh, what you practice in your approach also. Experience, a full-on holotropic experience, by a philosopher, even for 
education tank. And what struck me was business with Joseph Campbell, who studied all these mythologies around the world, identified as the hero of journey, and it had a thousand faces. So maybe when the Amazonian person is seeing some symbol for power, that's a jaguar. But when the Tibetan person sees the same thing, it's a snow lion. So maybe what you need is something like a dream dictionary to translate between these different stories to get to the, the essential story. If I understand you, you go in the uh, underground world, the underworld, which is still unconscious. You encounter a dragon there, you have to slay, so you're dealing with your psychodynamic issues. You go on to the spiritual stuff like dealing with Jungian archetypes. You may have an ego death and rebirth, so you're like Jason with the police coming back home. Maybe it's the same story over and over again. Each person has a different way of living. Did you see that kind of thing in our philosophy experience? I, I agree with you that we need better, like you know, talked about the archetypes, but <coughs> just one person working, you know, to try to work them out, and he came up with what he came up with, but it wasn't, you know, there weren't like legions of people working on the problem. And so that's a kind of undone work that needs to be completed, which would be a a better descriptive description of these archetypal processes and categories, you know, and cross-culturally sensitive, as you suggest, you know. Uh, and that's a kind of phenomenological work that clearly could be done. It's just, it hasn't been done. But it would be wonderful for that to, to take place. And I think you could collect many, many stories of transformation and look at those stories using qualitative methods and distill from that you know, the kind of things you're talking about. So that work has yet to be done. Uh, just to add, and, and, and to link back to the, uh, the person who asked initially about the Jaguar experience, and um, I had a student who was researching with Ayahuasca, and he, he found that kind of effect that you were describing. I didn't say it before because I don't feel I'm an expert on this, but that, that's what he came up with. And I think you know, the, the interesting point here is, uh, uh, is, again, it's about paradigms, because what you're saying, I mean, I think that's, that would be the, the normal paradigm, yeah? that uh, there's an archetypal base and uh, we're going to see, it's like the near-death experience, you know, if you're a Christian, you're going to see it one way, if you, you know, it's, it's, I think, you know, that's what we would generally, generally accept. But this phenomenon, which I think there, there is a bit, I think there is something there, and that opens up a different a, a paradigm, because that's suggesting that there is something in that plant realm, or it's not, I don't think it's a plant realm, it's something about the human plant interaction in that way, which, which maybe transcends the particular cultural dimensions of those archetypes. That, I think, is, as I say, I have an open mind. I mentioned a particular piece of research a student of mine did, so it falls in that direction. I have an open mind, but I think, I think we need to be open to that kind of paradigm that you're touching on there. Could you, could you repeat? Like, why is it that if this is, if the human spirit is something that's in all of us, why isn't it the norm? Why is it, I don't know how else to ask this. Yeah, I, 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 why doesn't it develop in all of us why more easily? Why is it attached to the physical world? Why is that more over the spiritual world? Well, there's the old story about the acorn and the oak. Many acorns. They don't all grow into great oaks. I mean, that's a naturalistic explanation. It's looking at nature. But you could, I, you, you could answer the question in many different ways. Uh, I think probably each of us would have a different... What, what would be your answer? <laughs> I, I think there are different aspects of the question, right? Um, I think there's two questions at least in there, and so I'm not quite sure exactly what you're asking. Um, if you're asking the question at a sort of humanistic level, why is it that some people 
deny the notion that there is a soul dimension to everything. Um, that's because of the baggage we all have in one way or another. You know, we, all, we, we construct our reality and there are many ways, many bases on which we construct that reality. And that's a whole discussion in itself. Um, because uh, um, Jim was bringing in William James earlier, you know, and, and uh, he wrote a great essay, The Will to Believe. Uh, and, and again, it, it's, it's a question of uh, what gives us value in our lives. And different people have different, th different, different criteria there. That's one kind of question. Uh, the, if, the, if the other, uh, maybe you're also asking, you know, why, why, do, pe why do researchers in different branches of, of science and psychology, you know, probably the majority do not recognize this quality that we would describe as human spirit. That's because re uh, researchers are no different to every member of the human species, that, that we have the beliefs that shape what we do and what we, what we place value in. And this is, you know, as we said before, many have a belief in scientism because, you know, because uh, you, you know, looking historically, whatever it was that we were interested in, let's say, you know, what, it, what causes lightning? Is it the gods? And then, you know, science comes along and says, no, 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 I've got an answer for that. Well, you know, and so, so the, the paradigm would be to say, well, whatever it may appear, spiritual and not merely physical, science is able to give it a physical answer. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the belief and most researchers I think in mainstream science articulate that belief. I would say things changed with consciousness. Well, well where did that start? Indigenous people didn't believe in human spirit. They did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm sorry, I missed that. Where did this start? Why well, that's a historical question, and uh, it's a big, it's a big. But you know, you can trace it. I mean, the Enlightenment, the uh, uh, Christianity's quest for power in 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 Europe. Uh, lots of factors led to the squeezing out of of spirit from from. Uh, the the world view that eventuates in science right? it's a big question but it's a good question <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question really does anyone want to take Thank a question
All these people who have spoken today, all the people on the panels, Jim and Stan, are all have been professionals within this field for many years. And they're still actively within that field. And I see it continuing to grow. <coughs> I want to kind of add to Jim Fadiman's challenge about asking how all of each of you will contribute to the world, or what you will contribute to the world, with your transpersonal vision and passion, and how you will carry that forward. Um, I'm very grateful to, very, to quite a few people who have helped this symposium happen. I want to thank all the people on the Yurtas board who took the the time and the expense to come all the way over here to share their knowledge, their expertise, and their passion for the field with all of us. I want to thank the ATP board for being supportive of this idea of kind of a last minute thing. We all know it takes years to put together one of these events and we pulled together and it happened. And there were quite a few people that came here. I'm really appreciative of the ATP board and all their support. I also want to thank the members of the ITA board that were willing to come and be a part of this. And I really enjoyed this new collaborative effort that's happening and that will continue in the Yertas conference in October of this year in Crete and Greece and also in 2015 in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I also want to thank Sophia University for co-hosting this event and allowing us to use this really nice auditorium. Specifically, I want to thank Kaleo and Shannon and Tia and probably other ones within Kaleo's department that I aren't even aware of that helped this event to happen. I want to thank Katrina and Kimberly and the people in the library that helped put together the AV part of this. I want to thank Julio for his technical expertise. There was no AV glitches this whole day, right? I mean, that's wow. <laughs> I also want to thank Ray for moderating, for Jacob for stepping in at the end, and especially Stan and Jim for the wonderful keynotes that they provided us. And I also want to thank all of you in the audience, because without you, there would be no symposium. And I really appreciate you coming out and supporting all the people that showed up from all over the world and for supporting ATP and Sophia. So I want to give all of us a hand. So one of the things about the transpersonal I find very interesting is that it doesn't necessarily make life easier. What it does is it makes a really passionate motivation to continue doing things that you know are right. And even though there was a lot of work and effort put into this symposium, I find myself really drawn to putting together a conference in 2016. <laughs> and I want to invite all of you, all of the board, and this will be a three-day one at least, so we'll have a lot more presenters than we did at this one. So I just want to place that seed thought that in 2016, um, in the Bay Area, then we'll have another transpersonal conference. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs>